I'm the CTO at, at Jaunt. I'm a, we're a company that's developing cinematic VR. And we need to develop some kind of cue, like I, when I wink, okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, so recently we've been doing some investor pitches, and this is the first slide that we used. And um, you know, it basically states so that VR is like the next big platform. It's just like the transition from desktop computing to laptops, or from laptops to tablets. You know, there's a new sort of uh, computing platform which is virtual reality, and it's going to allow you know a lot of things to be reinvented. Um, and then the question is, so do you agree? Because if you don't agree, this is going to be a very short meeting. <laughs> because it's very interesting, in terms of investors, they fall into two categories. The ones that believe in VR and the ones that don't. So I don't want to waste any time telling people about you know something that they don't believe in. Uh, we believe in it. Anyway. Um, so we, we are... Um, you know, doing cinematic VR, and cinematic VR is uh, is, t is taking v virtual reality beyond gaming. I mean, everybody's heard of the Oculus. It's a great platform for gaming. It's designed for gaming. It's designed by gamers. There's a lot of content for it, and gaming will make it extremely popular. And that's just a given, right? Because every game so far has been designed for VR. It's just displayed in 2D on a TV screen. Right, but it is inherently three-dimensional already. So there's a ton of content, and the content is very compelling when you use an Oculus device. So, however, that really narrows the audience to gamers, and we're more interested in creating sort of an entertainment experience where you record something, and then um, you can experience it. So it's less interactive, more laid back, but you could, you know, and, uh, you know, have a, a cinematic experience. The thing about doing that, though, it involves a very broad set of technologies, and actually a relatively hard problem. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But we think it will transform a bunch of different industries. So I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Um, music, you know, for example. You know, I, currently I can buy a ticket to go to a Rihanna concert. I can actually sit in the front row. I can, you know, look at her very close up. But I cannot buy a ticket to be on stage with Beyonce. Well, we can sell you that ticket. Or a ticket to be in the green room with her. Or maybe in the studio. Or maybe to be alone on the beach with Rihanna performing her latest, uh, her latest song. Yeah, I mean, th these are things that you cannot experience any other way. Um, you know, sports. You know, it's one thing to go to a Lakers game. You know, you sit in the tenth row. You know, it's very expensive, thousands of dollars. But we can put you, you know, on on the on the court side, and you can look at the the players. You can see how incredibly tall they are, and you can look at Jack Nicholson right next to you. And we can sell you that twenty five hundred dollar ticket for. Fifty dollars. Uh, obviously, film. You know, you go to go to the movies today. It's all about immersive movies. Uh, uh, IMAX is all about immersion. Uh, they, they, Brad Wexler, the chairman of IMAX, is actually on our advisory board. He loves what we're doing. You know, because IMAX is already about like how can I make entertainment more engaging, and so that's we're just kind of doing the next step in that. But here you need to sort of reimagine storytelling. Like how do you tell people where to look? How do you do a scene cut? How do you move the camera? It's like all about, you know, it has to be relearned. It's like the beginning of entertain or the beginning of movie making. Um, advertising, you know, you imagine a Doritos commercial that you want to watch ten times because you've missed parts of it, you know, where there's a hundred things going on. It's a it's for advertisers a very compelling idea to have, you know, more than a hundred percent engage engagement. Um, you know, news is interesting. One of the things that's interesting, if you if you put this camera you know, at a, at a demonstration, you know, even if there's a reporter there, the reporter tells you where to look in, on TV. They, they point the camera at the protesters. 
but here you have complete freedom. It's, 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 you can look at the police, you can look at the protesters, you can look at the reporter, you can look at the bystanders, you, know, you can look at the burning building, you can look anywhere. So it gives you a freedom and a, and a uh, sort, of, sort of an unbiased view of what is going on that you cannot get any other way. Um, travel, you know, I, what's the beach really like at the hotel? You know, what does my hotel room look like? Can I see the pool from there? Um, you know, education, you know, if you, if you can be in a classroom that's much more engaging than watching it in a web browser, or maybe you're training for something that requires you know, social interaction or, you know, first aid or, you know, police training or military training, those are all things that work much better in VR because you can really feel like you're there. Um, so in, in terms of our background, we're, we're about a year old, a little more than a year old. We were based in, in, we're based in Palo Alto, in downtown Palo Alto. We raised uh, 6.8 million from Redpoint and, and a few strategic investors, including Sky TV. And, um, you know, when we, we were in stealth until April of this year, if you go to the next slide. And in April, we decided that stealth was kind of boring because we really couldn't talk about what we were doing, and everybody else was talking about it. And right in the, the week after Facebook announced the acquisition of Oculus, um, we had a PR campaign and we announced the company and what we were doing and we showed the demos to a bunch of reporters. That was very fortunate timing, by the way, and it wasn't planned that way. Um, because a lot of people are excited about VR and they're excited about the possibilities and they're excited about, you know, what Facebook might do and what Oculus might do and, you know, how can I get involved. And so I'll tell you a little bit about a few of the projects that we've done um, that we're working on. This is a, 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 a string quartet that we recorded at the Bing Theater. They called me up that week on Friday and said, hey, we're rehearsing at the Bing Theater tomorrow, can you come? And recorded them. You can see the camera standing here. Um, that actually came out really well. You can see that in the demo later. We are doing a, a shoot, uh, a horror picture with Greg Plotkin, who's the director of Paranormal Activity, you know, the movies. I don't I don't watch them because I think horror is very scary. <laughs> but imagine horror in VR, that's really scary. Um, so that we've done the shoot, we're just in post-production on that one. Um, we're doing some boxing uh, events and that there, you know, these kinds of events, boxing in particular, you know, if you're in the audience, you're looking up at the ring, and even if you're in the front first seat, it's, it's actually not a very good seat, you know. But we have the camera standing above the ring, looking down in, and you can really see what's going on. It's actually quite compelling. Um, we're doing a project with Bjork. Uh, we're going to Iceland in a couple of weeks to shoot that. And we, we just last weekend we were at the Electric Daisy Festival in Las Vegas. And we recorded this 400,000 visitors. It's incredible. That was actually, we got some great footage from that. Um, we showed it to a bunch of people. Uh, Mark Romanek is a famous music video director who's who's uh, on our advisory board, and he, he introduces us to the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And so this is our VP of content, who for some reason is wearing a shirt, <laughs> talking to the, the lead singer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and they want to do something. I don't know if that's going to happen. We'll see. Um, and then we're, because of our relationship with Sky TV, we're doing something with David Attenborough in the, in the next few months. He's doing a new series called Masters of the Sky, which would be kind of interesting. Um, and then we've been approached by Virgin Galactic. They want to do a training video for passengers. And the, the problem with that is that we have to withstand the, the shake test, which I'm not sure that's going to going to work, but uh, the vibration test is what they call it. But they want to take it up in space and, and you know, use it as a training video for, for new passengers. Um, so just a little bit about the technology. Um, like, feel free to ask questions if you, if you want, because it's such a small group, it's easier to make it interactive. Um, in terms of the technology, we, we've 
kind of been at this for a year, but we, we had to build everything. So the whole idea got started when Tom, one of our founders, he was in uh, Bryce Canyon, and he, he, uh, he, he sent us his email, and he said, well, I'm in Bryce Canyon, and I can send you a picture, but what I really want is like a Gigapan camera and an Oculus Rift, so you can really experience what it's like to be here, because it's so beautiful. And he, he, sent his, he sent his email, and we thought, well, you know, maybe we should get an Oculus Rift, and maybe we should try to take some pictures and create a panorama and see how, if that works. And it actually worked quite well. We didn't go to Bryce Canyon, we just did it in my backyard, but it, it did work. What? Beautiful. Yeah. Um, we, uh, but what we found is that you, you know, none of the things that you need exist, so we have to go build them. So we, we have to build, you know, calibrated panoptic cameras. We need to develop computational photography algorithms to extract depth and to do all the stitching. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, record spatial 3D audio. We need to have customized production tools for post-production. We need to have you know, apps across a variety of platforms for viewing the content. And none of these things exist. We have to go build them. So we, we went off and we, we built some of those. Um, this is our first camera. It's a single lens that just goes around in the, with the help of some Legos. And that's what we used to make, take a picture in my backyard. It took, you know, 30 pictures and were able to construct like a really compelling 3D view of my backyard from that. And that, that was sort of the first uh, one that we built. And then the second one we built is this one. This is a 3D printed sphere with 32 lenses on it. And there's a, a, a 3D microphone on top. And this records in all directions. This required a big cabinet full of equipment because it's all power over Ethernet cameras and switches and GPUs and it was very impractical. Um, but that was our first camera that we built. We built that last summer and that's what got us our funding. We showed it to VCs and and they loved it and you know we didn't even have a pitch. We just showed them the, the demo and they went, cool, how much money do you need? Um, uh, this is the camera we use now. This, you can see it over here. This is uh, made out of action cameras, actually GoPros inside. And the reason we do that is that it's much more practical than the previous camera. It's sort of portable. You can take it on an airplane and record stuff. Um, we have a number of these that we're using in production right now. All of the content you'll see is recorded with that. We're, we're, we are, it's still a prototype. We are building our own camera hardware that doesn't use off-the-shelf components because there's a lot of things wrong with this design. Um, you know, we're very well aware of what the shortcomings are, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the sort of whole pipeline, it's very hard to read here, is basically you, you record... Then there is, then you end up with 14 HD, 60 frames per second video streams that you need to encode into a panoramic video. So you have a bunch of, you know, GPU code to do that. Then there's some post-production. Then we reformat for distribution, and then we reformat for different distribution platforms like the Oculus or the Morpheus, or, or for you can also render it in 2D, so you can view it on iPad. Um, that's sort of the whole pipeline in, in a nutshell. All of these things are complicated and are in, in flux all the time, so you kind of have to ad adopt and, and, and uh, be agile in a way. Um, here's a, I hope you guys can see this. This is a, an example of a panorama that we shoot. You know, you, 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 these are the raw images at the top, some of the raw images. And the first thing that you'll notice is that the, the gain is very different between the cameras because these are all independently operated GoPros and one is looking into the sun and one is looking at the ground and sort of the color and, and gain is very different. So we have to correct for that. The white balance is very different. I mean, you look at different in colors. They, they're pointing at different heights and they're not perfectly calibrated because it's just the 3D printed shell. And, and then on top of that, there's this huge lens distortion. If you look at how, how round the bridge is over here and how straight it is in that one. So all of these things sort of make it very hard to actually create a, a, a consistent panoramic image. And, uh, but we, we do. We, we were able to create a, a beautiful panorama from it and basically work backwards and undo some of those shortcomings. And then 
on top of that, you know, we have to do that 60 frames a second. And on top of that, we want to do it in stereo. So we're not just taking, you know, the images from the cameras. We're actually, you know, projecting a virtual left and a virtual right eye. So I think that's the next slide. Yeah. So you, you end up with two sort of spherical panoramas, one for the left eye, one for the right eye, that then gets shown uh, when you're viewing the content. Post-production tools. We we have our own web-based rendering workflow, and then we use things like. Pro Tools and Final Cut and, and Nuke and those kinds of tools for doing post-production. And when you go work with people in Hollywood, they all, you know, are oh, you know, we gotta use this tool and gotta do this color scheme format, blah blah blah. They're very particular about this stuff, so you can't sort of build your own tools and use those. Um, and um, you know, with that, we can do special effects and post-production. Um, we're, we're working with the Dolby. Dolby, on, uh, you know, we're using Dolby Atmos sound. Dolby Atmos is the, the Dolby theater sound system. Um, that's uh, something we, we, we uh, you know, Peter Gocher is the chairman of Dolby. He's on our board. He's put us in touch with that. And, and it actually allows us to, to, do, to add special effects with sound very easily in post-production. And it's actually very important because, you know, it's unlike you know, a normal movie where you're told where to look, with with VR you have to be you have to know where to look. You have to basically hear something and then you look and then something happens and you hear something somewhere else. And that's kind of a cue we use for directing people's attention. Um, and then we have a variety of viewing platforms. We're doing, you know, Oculus Rift, of course. So, you know, we're doing Mac and PC. We're doing something with Sony. We're, we're working on mobile VR kits, like the one that Google announced. We're trying to do an Android version of our player. Did you guys see that? They have a cardboard VR kit. That's pretty cool. Um, and then, uh, you know, we have an iPad, an iOS renderer as well. Um, next. Then in our office we have this awesome demo room, which is much better than you have here. We, uh, you know, here we use headphones, but in our office we've set up this this uh, uh, speaker array that is fully spherical, and that gives you very directional sound. So if something comes from behind you, it, it definitely comes from behind you. Whereas in headphones, back to front uh, audio is, is hard. You know, left to right is easy, uh, and if you is a picture of one of our people in the in the room when it's operational. It's pretty cool. Um, and in the future, you know, we're doing a lot of future development. Um, you know, we're we're not nearly done. All the parts in the pipeline can be improved. You know, we're working on on uh, improving the resolution, the frame rates, the dynamic range of the camera systems. We're doing, you know, artificial focus. I mean, you can think of this as a as a big Lytro camera. The Lytro uses micro disparity. We use macro disparity, so we can have a, a, a larger range. But you could do artificial focus, for example. Uh, we're developing codecs. We're we're doing uh, uh, multiple viewpoints, so you can switch cameras. We're we're, we're working on making it more social because otherwise it's a very lonely experience. We're, we're working on your avatar, so when you look down, you can see yourself, which actually sounds cheesy, but it is really compelling when you do it. If you ever try the Morpheus, they use the, the move controllers for your hands, and you see your own hands, and it really adds a ton of realism. It's actually surprising how easy your brain is tricked into thinking that those are your own hands. Um, and then we're, we're working on real time, you know, but that's more of a longer term project. Um, and we're hiring, in case you're interested. We're, uh, we're looking for lots of different people, mostly in, in you know, software development, but also in, uh, you know, production and, you know, a variety of other areas. So there you have it.